What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Rock and Roll Gypsy Diaries. This is a special discussion panel with Liam from Flicker Tail. We're discussing so, Kiss from 1980 until about 96, 97, I guess we'll call it, before the reunion tour. Really, it seems like a, a time that's glossed over in every Kiss documentary we end up getting. And instead of, I just figured we'd start here because it's not discussed as much. And I think there's a lot of parts in this moment in history, as we will. Um, really, there's some bright moments in this era, wouldn't you say? And I really feel like this, this era was important to keeping the band alive. Yeah, totally. I, I think that, um, I think that for a lot of people, like the only kiss they acknowledge is like the original kiss from like 74 to 79 or, you know, maybe they only acknowledge it up to like Alive 2 or something. But if you look at it chronologically, you know, there's over a decade's worth of material pre-reunion so like between the two classic lineup yeah. eras right from i think they did what, more albums to make up too yeah that's right they didn't release them as quickly but i'm pretty sure if from 73 they started 74 is the debut album 79 or 1980 peter quits and then the reunion tour is 96 i want to say yeah right yeah. So that's like 16 years ish. I'm pretty sure if my timing is correct. Correct. Um, and, you know, they didn't have the blistering pace of the early 70s where they were releasing one or two albums every year, but you've got 16 years worth of material. And um, a lot of it, a lot of it's rubbish, which we'll get to. Um, a lot of it's really good, which we'll get to. I but find that I think era there is stuff like the Bruce really like. You know? Yeah, but I feel like a lot, particularly a lot of the Bruce Kulick era stuff, uh, yeah. to me, is like some of my favorite material, uh, particularly as you get to the later years of his tenure with the band. Yeah. I don't know, though. I still think Asylum's a really good record if it was more produced like Revenge, but we can get into that. <laughs> yeah. The thing I find about Kiss is no matter what they did that was different about their style, which we'll get into as we start, even um there was still a certain element where it was always kiss you know what i mean they never strayed too far away yeah i mean they clearly had a formula that worked like yeah. you know they're they're occasionally they'll do the big misstep of you know like trying to be too self-consciously epic or writing about stuff that's i suppose a bit of a step away from the the classic kiss canon but ultimately you, know, you gotta admire the them for being brave enough and bold enough to take those missteps you know? yeah and I'll, I'll look ultimately the the core of the band is always paul stanley's songwriting gene's songwriting and their two voices um mm -hmm. obviously everyone contributes to the sound but i think that for a lot of fans in particular the 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 uh, the cornerstone of the band's identity was Paul's voice and the way that he writes like songs. Like Lennon and McCartney, really. Mm. Yeah, totally. And um, something that I often say, and you know, if people always disagree with me, I don't care. Come for me in the comments. I don't give a fuck. Leave one right there. Um, Kiss is the Beatles of the 70s. Yeah, which is, I've, I've said the same thing. That was what they were trying to do. Yeah, which is kind of, which is kind of funny because like they outlasted the Beatles they outlasted virtually everybody yeah uh, if, you look at, if you look at stones you know yeah pretty much <laughs> um, but you know if you look at the dynamic within the band you've got like four big personalities people had a favorite member um the Beatles as much as the Rolling Stone writers of the world have tried to kind of, kind of recast them as like permanent rock gods the Beatles were a pop band to start with um like the like, like the matching suits and the well the thing is hats. that the definition of music has changed since then so nowadays pop bands don't play their own instruments you know what i mean for the yeah that's totally right 
And I think that people... So have... I think that's why there's a different in definition. Because yeah. by today's standards, the Beatles would be considered an early rock band. So. Yeah. But I think that's, ultimately, that's just down to semantics. Yeah. And Agreed. For me, I think that if you, if you look at it in terms of influence, saturation, you know, how indelibly a band is associated not only with that era but the music that followed them that cites them as a major influence yeah and then move beyond that into all all the branding and the merchandising and yeah the the idea that something has moved beyond the music you know yeah it's a, it's a long way from love me do to john lennon bobbleheads you know oh, what yeah. I mean? uh, ag- agreed a hundred percent you know, and like the Beatles, Kiss definitely progressed. And unfortunately, they started off 1980 with a bomb. I think it's a good record for what it is. Um, There's some songs on it, like Tomorrow, that are like, eh. But songs like Naked City, I think, are fantastic. And Torpedo Girl and Talk to Me is one of Ace's best. You know? Yeah. Um, so... You may not know this, but uh, Unmasked was actually a big hit in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a DVD that covers this era with bootleg footage from Kids Are People 2 and the whole Australia press thing where they had the satellite TV where they're walking on the World Trade Center. And yeah. So so you'd be familiar with the fact. It was like it was a big hit here. Shandy yeah. was a hit. Uh, Talk To Me was a minor hit. Um but I'm pretty sure the Australia tour in 1980 was the first time they toured with Eric Carr. Yeah. He played and, uh, a New York City Palladium show and then they went to Australia. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and then it also marks the first time that Kiss were using outside songwriters for most of an album. So... Yeah, because Desmond Child only... on I Was Made for Loving You, I think, on the previous, but he that's, that's right. And obviously Desmond Child went on to become one of the biggest songwriters of all time. Oh yeah. If people don't know, he co-wrote Slippery When Wet with John Bon Jovi. You yeah. Know, stuff like that. Yeah, he's he's like and like he did poison <laughs> for Alice Cooper. Like he's almost single handedly responsible for that. Like mm-hmm. yeah, Aerosmith did heaps of stuff for Aerosmith um who suck but he did heaps of stuff for them and yeah so the um the only two songs that are only written by a member of kiss were talk to me and two sides of the coin which is another one i really like yeah and i actually think that ironically for what is widely considered to be like the pop album so to speak uh, i think that's got ace's best material i think that ace really turned his hand to like this power pops writing style that's kind of had more in common with cheap trick than with kiss and turned yeah, out to be ace quite good at it. Aura that that reminded, pretty... ace reminds me of johnny thunders in that way he, he's not the most proficient or technically proficient but put him in the right setting with the you know he's he, he he has that tough guy b- rock and roll borderline punk, which with the pop elements of what they were doing was right up his alley. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I I really think that his best song is Talk To Me. I think it's the best song he ever wrote. Um, to And, you know, it's to, it's to a point where he's... I, a friend of mine... Uh, opened for Ace Frehley's solo band on the Anomaly Tour when they came to Australia. Nice. And he was a big Kiss fan. And he told Ace, you've got to play Talk To Me. And he wasn't going to, he was like, no one likes that song. No one cares about Unmasked. And this guy was like, no, like that's a song here. Like people care about that song here. All the fans want to hear it. So Ace and his band learned Talk To Me that night. Oh, wow. To be able to play it on that tour. Yeah, it was like one of the highlights of my life. I was like 17. Amazing. Yeah. But I definitely agree with you. And I mentioned Torpedo Girl, but I really don't think that, I I think Unmasked 
Obviously, it's a lighter album. It's got a lighter production. Yeah. You know, some keyboards. Like I said, I think Naked City is one of Gene's best or better songs. Yeah. I think that's and also also Anton Biggs a way better drummer than Peter Chris. <laughs> well, that's documented. His stuff on Freely's Comet is fucking phenomenal too. You know, yeah, totally. I think Ace actually wanted him in Freely's Comet, but he wouldn't tour or something like that. Yeah, which you know, I think that's right. I think that he got the Letterman gig. Yeah, I don't have my time. Yeah, Letterman, but I think he, I think he got the Letterman gig and was like, I'm definitely just going to make a shitload of money. And not have to tour. Yeah. Which, like, if you don't like touring... That's perfect. Yeah. Because, like, look, some people love it, some people don't. I personally really love it, but I also know a lot of guys who fucking hate doing it. And, like, Freely's Comet would touring at a much lower level than Kiss would have been. Yeah. I can understand why... I can understand why he was like, I don't want to do, like, a van tour with the guy from Kiss, you know? Exactly. Um... Which, funny enough, I, I think they considered Anton Fig for a replacement when they were making the album, and he was a member for like a day <laughs> <laughs> or something. Like that. Yeah, um, but I yeah, think but the it, album still has all the right elements of like what we know as classic. Kim. Like, yeah, I totally more agree. More than enough okay. similarities. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they didn't stray too far. Um, you know, and yeah, I know all too well how big they were in Australia for that tour. I mean, they were on the front page of the news like a single day. But they're pretty close to a, a repair shop. And wasn't there some kind of conflict or something going on? At That's the right. Time? Yeah. And they were so big that they were bigger than the bad news that was going on. I mean, that, you know, that's rock and roll. That's what rock and roll could do, man. Bring people together yeah. at the worst possible time, you know. And you know, all the all of Ace's guitar work on this album is really good. Yeah, and it's all Ace, unlike what a lot of people say, where you know, there's only a few handful instances where Ace wasn't on a Kiss record. You know? Yeah, although there is a note here for um, on I've just got Wikipedia open. Uh, Bob Kulik does play additional guitar on the album. I have no idea what that means. It's not particular. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the problem uh, with Wikipedia is some of the sources can be sketchy. Yeah, for sure. But it does also say that on Naked City, uh, Bob Kulik was a co-writer. So I wouldn't be surprised if they just brought him in as a ringer. Probably. For a song that he had to write on, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, because it's really, it's honestly, when you listen to the stuff on a live too, that, Bob Kulik is confirmed to play on. It's kind of hard to tell his playing from aces at times if you put them back to back. Yeah. I think he has such a classic session guy style where he doesn't really have a particular fingerprint to his playing. Which can be good and bad at the same time. Yeah, totally. And, you know, if you listen to Jimmy Page's guitar playing on any of the session records that he did, he doesn't sound like Jimmy Page. He only sounded like Jimmy Page for Led Zeppelin. Yeah. And I think that if I was Bob Kulik, you know, as a guitar player for hire quite a bit of my life now, um, I would be playing like Kiss style guitar. I would be trying to do maybe not Ace style guitar, but playing guitar in a way that fits the band, which yeah. means you inherit a few Aceisms. Absolutely. I think yeah. that's why Bruce worked out so well later on, which we'll get to that. It doesn't take long because there's a lot of shifting. The one thing about this era is the shifting of members in such a short amount of time. Um, yeah, and, you know, obviously... We already they, started off the decade with Eric replacing Peter. Yeah, and that, I suppose that leads us neatly into what is widely considered the single biggest misstep <laughs> of the entire KISS canon. Which is the which is Elder, me. which actually has an anniversary right now happening, which is ironic. That's right. Yeah. Which is nice to see them actually acknowledge it, because let me just say, I get it. 1981 with Iron Maiden and the new wave of British heavy metal and all that. 
for Kiss to put out this record at that time, at this juncture, was the completely wrong time. Now, I like this album, but I don't think it should have been a Kiss record. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah for because, sure. I mean, I think that if you said, had it The Elder featuring music by the members of Kiss, I think that would have fared better than a Kiss record. Yeah, I also th think that the band had been in the like everything we touch turns to gold they almost needed we do it. whatever we want parallel universe of fame for what five years at this point yeah and that surely changes how you interact with the world um there's a lot of stories about bob ezra doing a superhuman amount of cocaine yeah. At the time, which changes how you deal with stuff. Well, we both read Paul's book, so we know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think... And they were having problems with Ace. Yeah, I mean, to the point where he was... I don't think he even showed up to the same studio they were using and recorded no, stuff in his home studio and sent it over. Send them back. Yeah, so like this, this it's, it feels as disconnected as it was for me. As an album, you know, you listen to it, and the 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 songs often feel kind of stapled together. There's not a lot of cohesion from one section to the next, which may have been the thing they were going for, and also may have made more sense if the movie that was supposed to happen ever got made. I wish they would do something. You know, they've done so many comics and stuff like that. Do a freaking graphic novel and explain the story of the elder. I I, I yeah. I, I just. You know, it's fine and dandy for them to admit that it was a complete mistake and they were out of their heads. They lost focus. It was their spinal tap moment. That's all well yeah. and good. But at the same time, you can't really I, I, I feel like you almost get in a way because they just I'm glad they finally acknowledged it with a, you know, anniversary run of merch. Mm. Like it really. Yeah irks me just a little bit that they don't give you the whole experience so you can actually understand it. Like, yeah. Like and I think the that, feelings on it, it almost, you know, <laughs> they, they, they said they had casting. Yeah, right. And I... You can't tell also think you can't have someone put together a graphic novel or at the least and call it and it, have it be the story of the elder done that way that would sell outrageously just because fans would finally get the elder storyline you can't tell yeah, me I think, obuku i think that that the limited like the, picture, that, like, picture just sold out in an hour and it was 150 bucks it had the alternative japanese cover yeah so i think that this um like there's super dedicated kiss fans who'll just throw money at things that have the faces on it 100 percent buy it but if i'm i, I had that disposable income <laughs> don't we all don't we all but you know if i'm putting myself in tommy Thayer's shoes because i'm pretty sure he manages the like admin of the band or at least he was at one point he was very heavily involved with the kissology project for example. <laughs> oh yeah as far back you, as the 90s before the reunion tour even started yeah you would probably go all right we could sell a few thousand music from the older dvds or graphic novels or picture discs or whatever or we can do like i don't know kissology for and it'll go platinum mm -hmm. yeah I see. Right. And I still feel like I, the elder storyline is worth a lot of money, especially for Kiss fans. Yeah. And I, I think that contributing to the, the issue with this is the infamous track shuffling that happens. Yes. Where s certain tracks, uh, I believe, are World Without Heroes and The Oath were shuffled 
mm. in the vinyl track listing to emphasize yeah. singles. I uh, had, so for anyone who's I, yeah, I had an original vinyl copy and cassette as a kid. And when I got the remaster CD, I was really confused why Fanfare was first. Because yeah. on the all vinyl pressings, it was the oath that started it off. And I think Fanfare came second, so it was really weird. Yeah, even even though having Fanfare first makes all the sense. Yeah. It, it didn't feel right, though, because that's how I had heard it originally. But now I haven't yeah. heard it in the original way in so long. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's a very weird album in a lot of ways. It seems like there's a lot of, as I mentioned before, a lot of ideas and there's a lot, like occasionally you'll hear a cool riff or like a cool melody or something, but just as quickly as it appears, it disappears. Uh, particularly with the difference between how the record sounds and how the songs sound live. So if you've heard the live performances of The Oath, for example, where the song, it sounds like it could be a Creatures of the Night song. Yeah. When they play it live, particularly with Eric Carr's drumming. Yeah. And he was and always a much... Solo by Ace. Yeah. Yeah, and Ace is just ruling the solo. Oh, yeah. He fucking ripped. And then, like, you have the recorded version that's got, like, Paul Stanley doing his like little boy falsetto like this like hitting that like choir boy castrato type of range yeah, he, he, just a bit like this is not what like i wanted alfalfa from kiss. when alfalfa tried to sing all high <laughs> yeah a little rascal. yeah oh uh, and i think that where a lot of people dislike the album and where i can appreciate that perspective is that after almost a decade of like keg party, like fist pumping rock songs about like sex and loving life, they, there was like this self-consciously grandiose record about like yeah. a boy who is called to greatness, which is so clearly how Gene Simmons sees himself. It's it, like, if, you know what I mean? It feels a bit, it feels a bit like my pet theory I don't know if I really believe it's fun to think about is that was the elder him singing about the Beatles blessing him with the gift of holy rock and roll to take over the yeah, world. Yeah, you know, like something like that where <laughs> Gene sees himself as the hero of the as the hero of like his life, which you should. Yeah. It's your life. But I think that. You know, it follows this like very like Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. You've got the call to action. You know, the, like there's this fucking magic wizard named Morpheus who like yes. subjects him to trial so he can go and save the universe or whatever it is. I am just a bit like Gene Simmons clearly loves himself, which is again fine. I probably wouldn't if I was Gene Simmons, but I have a bit of a pet theory that's fun to think about. Where it's just like next time I listen to the record, just imagine that all of it is just Gene being like, "This is me." This is like an author insert for me. I finally get to be a superhero. I I almost feel like with Bob Esser and coming off the wall and him doing so much drugs, I feel mm. like that combination too helped push that direction. And of course, when Gene realized he could be as self-indulgent as he wanted to be, even more so than his solo record. I mean, God. Um, yeah. You know, I feel like that's... But... I, like you said, and it's an interesting perspective that I never thought about before on that level, but it makes sense. Like I have, but I haven't, where they almost needed the elder to happen to get them to hit rock bottom and wake up, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I'm not saying they needed a flop, but having a flop led them to create the next album, which I think is one of my favorite kiss albums of all time i've got the gold record over there creatures yeah and, and like i think Ace, like before, think we, officially... before we touch on sorry just before we touch on creatures i want to touch on what okay. i've got back here oh yeah killers that's right that that's in between the two this you record get here. to run i'm a legend tonight which are great songs and then down on your knees and partner and partners in crime I like them both too. 
Uh, Partners in Crime, I'm pretty sure, is almost exactly the same song as No Way to Run, which is hilarious. Yeah. Well, the, you, you you can hear on those tracks, though, what they were going to be doing with Creatures, kind of. They were going definitely back to basics. Yeah. yeah and they totally. sound great. I think those... I'm also pretty sure... I'm going to double check this. I'm just looking at the back of my vinyl here. And it says that Michael James Jackson produced uh, yeah. the original yeah. songs from Killers. Yes. And I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he produced Creatures of the Night. Let me check the yep. internet. He produced yeah. Creatures and Lick It Up. And he was supposed to produce Animal Eyes, but I think he's co-producer on Animal Eyes. Maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that, like the songs are pretty good. I'm a Legend Tonight is the best song of the four. By oh, a long yeah. way. Agreed. I fucking, I've played that song on my radio show. I adore it. And I also think that it's a bit of a, as you say, it's a bit transitional. It's a sign of things to come because the only four new songs are Paul Stanley songs. Yeah. Which really heralds the era of the 80s. Absolutely. Where Paul Stanley pretty much was the band. And you can hear that. I mean, I think Gene had some good songs, but he definitely had a lot of filler that's not memorable or, you know. I think one uh, we'll get into the, some of the later yeah. stuff, but um, yeah, we'll come we'll, we'll come come around to it. But um, yeah, he started acting. I, I think even at Creatures, which we're about to talk about, Paul got irritated because he brought in a choir of kids to sing on a track in exchange for a movie deal. That's correct. Yeah, which um, album was that? Was that Rock and Roll Hell? I don't know. I don't I'm not sure, I'm not sure because I don't record. remember there being children on that record. Yeah, I don't um, hear any. That's yeah. why I'm curious. Paul must have got his way. Yeah. That's what happened. Paul Stanley ruled with an iron fist from that moment onwards. I, talk, I talked before about how I often wonder if there's an incident that leads people to like seize control, you know? And surely that was it for Paul. He was like, you're, you have no idea what you're doing, Gene Simmons. didn't even talk to Paul about it and just, you know. Yeah self-serving but um yeah but i did i did check the personnel for killers while we're still on it oh yeah and although ace freely is obviously credited for the the greatest hits songs um bob kulik plays the lead guitar for the four new songs and eric carr obviously his drums are the new ones so it's almost like a um like a little preview of the Bruce Kulik era. Yeah. Because you've got you've got his brother playing lead guitar. And also, like, you know, Bob played the lead guitar on Paul's solo album. So obviously he liked him enough to bring him back to do the same thing again, right? Yeah. Paul had two solo bands for his solo record, and Bob was in both of them. And he was the only member of that that was in both of them. That's really interesting. Yeah, so it's pretty... One on each coast, L.A. and New York. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I think that's a great record. I had that on... I had an original cassette. Yeah. I was a kid, and, and, you know, I've lost it throughout the years of moving, but... Yeah. It's a great... I like those songs, and I like, you know... It's a pretty lame cover, but... Overall, pretty good, pretty decent couple of songs on it. Um, but Creatures of the Night, on the other hand, is Creatures is a different Creatures. Ha- the thing I like about Kiss is the records have a mood, and Creatures definitely has a dark mood, like an ambient quality. But you know what I mean? Um, yeah, for sure. Very aggressive. It's probably. I've always said Creatures of the Night is my favorite Kiss record, but Ace Frehley is my favorite member. Yeah, I don't care how weird that sounds. That's just yeah. All right. You know, um, it's weird that his face was on the cover when that's the first record where you could tell Ace didn't play on it. And yeah. they had well, quite a few people on this album. 
Uh, I think Steve Ferris did the guitar solo for Creatures. Vinny played and co-wrote a lot of it. But yeah, that's that's right. Uh, and you can really hear Vinny's style when he's on any any of the songs because as as Gene and Paul often complained about him, he just vomits notes. He just like weird because in Kiss like, he played a lot differently than he did on his own. And I think yeah. that's because Paul and Gene were able to keep the ropes on him enough in the studio, at least. Although the live at Rio show that they did on the Creatures tour, I didn't see too much of that overplaying like I did on the solo stuff. So, yeah, uh, I think that maybe maybe on the solo stuff, like with his name in lights and his name on it, he was like, oh, my time to shine. It was awful. Puking. No soul. Yeah just no soul but it's weird because the stuff he played on creatures was i think brilliant really good yeah and the writing for creatures is really yeah. fantastic i don't i uh and like i said the live stuff that he did on the tour i haven't heard anything bad from that so i don't you know maybe it's the certain shows that we don't have access to i don't know but um, Maybe. I mean, and but also, you know, you know yourself that when you're when you're in the band, you hear mistakes and inadequacies awesome. much more loudly yeah. than anyone in the audience would. And you're definitely so more that's... critical because you're making it. Yeah, yeah. But and I think that I think perhaps that lack of self criticism. Yeah, that too. might be what got him out of the got him booted out of the band to begin with yeah absolutely yeah i think i think creatures is a really strong record i also think it's got the last really strong gene material up until revenge uh and like it's not to say there aren't like perfectly serviceable gene songs yeah in the oh i know it's popularly termed the unmasked era but the i think that the last really met like really cool gene song would probably be war machine for me yeah i really like killer too yeah killer is also an awesome song and clear and also very clearly influenced by the kind of proto thrash mm -hmm. that was happening in the u.s at the time by the new wave of british heavy metal like the songs are faster the drums are more aggressive there's a lot more of that palm muting style, much more of the speed picking thing, which... But it's not too much 70s, different from what Kiss normally does, though, either, at the same time. No, and I, I think that Paul Stanley's voice is, and songwriting is the biggest factor there. I think, curiously, for a, a record as, I don't know, as heavy as Creatures, because we typically associate Gene with like heavy kiss. Yeah. There's not heaps of what I would term classic Gene Simmons bass parts. Agreed. Well, I know that Eric Carr played drums on uh, or bass on I Still Love You. Yeah. Well, I mean, that makes sense because there's like three notes. Yeah. Anyway, like, like that's probably the only bass part he could play. Well, Boom. actually, Boom. one thing Boom. I was going to say was um, I think Eric actually wrote Under the Rose, but Paul and Gene took it and made it different. Sounds like something that would have happened. Eric was really unhappy. Maybe that, maybe that was the source yeah. of all of his angst. Yeah. But no, um, like apparently Eric was a proficient musician, not just a drummer. Yeah, I read that he taught himself to play guitar when he joined the band because I think he wanted to have a songwriting role. Yeah, and that Gene, I wonder, because he's credited with that. Gene and Paul, certainly Paul Stanley wasn't about to have a drummer tell him how to write songs. No. I think that uh, as the 80s wore on, Eric would co-write with Bruce Kulick. Mm -hmm. And I think he perhaps co-wrote with Gene, but I could be incorrect. Um, but I, overall, I think Creatures is a very strong record. I think it was the last really strong 
album on all fronts until Revenge. And I think that yeah, it's certainly beats The Elder on pretty much every measurable front. Well, um, yeah, it's definitely... Except, except, except maybe Honesty, you know, because, yeah. like, the guy on the front cover isn't the guy on the album. Yeah. But, I mean, I think Creatures is my all-time favorite Kiss record. Um, I think that the circumstances that the album was made and the last one with makeup. And, you know, I got to say, as much as, you know, I don't know if Paul and Gene are aware of this, but I know a lot of people who love that era and that makeup design. I don't know. I thought Vinny looked cool. I thought Eric looked cool. Their characters fit. You know, there was no real story about where their characters came from. You know, I thought it was cool. I didn't see a problem with it image wise. I think I, I, I always liked Eric Carr. He's had a soft spot for Eric Carr and for the Fox thing. The yeah, hawk, same here. bad choice. Very, very, very good decision not to do the hawk thing. But okay. the fox thing was cool. I think Vinny's like Egyptian warrior. Shtick. I think Vinny just looked weird to begin with. Maybe that's it. Vinny had a weird shaped face. Let's not be weird. Like for some reason, on the cover, look it up. Paul said he wore a wig, and he looked great, but he never wore it again. I read that. I, that I, I remember Paul him. being like. The rest of them had that really dense hair like mine, actually, that really yeah. dense curly hair. But Vinny obviously had that really like thin, fine hair. It, and it yeah, wasn't. He, he was just odd on all fronts. Very strange. Man, I feel, like we're, I feel like I'm just shitting on this like old man right now. But I know, right? But he's a very strange looking dude. Well, like, oh, if it makes you feel any better, there's been repeated times where he screwed over fans. So, oh yeah, I I don't feel bad about ripping on him him for his behavior, <laughs> but I don't feel fantastic about making fun of him for his looks. No, but, but I'm he's, they're like we're I mean, if we, we can lend it to lick it up from here because if you look at the cover of Lick It Up, which I have somewhere, <laughs> where, hey, there he is. Um, Right, look at you know you know the the video for Lick It Up. Yeah. Right. The first thing you see is like a close up of like one of their crotches, and then it like suddenly pans out, mm -hmm. and you select the four dudes like this. Yeah. Right. And you've got you realize that like the dudes in Kiss are kind of weird looking. Yeah. Well, maybe you should all yeah. make up. Paul looks all right. Paul's the most human looking out of a lot of them. Eric Carr looks like, if you, if you take away the hair, he looks like all the Italian uncles that all my friends have. Yeah, Mario. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, Paolo Caravello. Uh, and um, I punched you so in the face. Sorry. sorry, sorry for that accent. I'm not making fun. Uh, I, I'm, I, it's just funny. Um, yeah. Even though it's kind of a cool, like, I really love this cover. Actually, I think Lick It Up has one of the one of the nicest, yeah, like, clearest, crispest Kiss album covers. Even though it's not like artwork, I think the oh, photo is really yeah. cool. They're well dressed. I think the the contrast of like they've all got black hair over the white background. Agreed. Yeah. And, you know, they still they look like a rock band here. You know what I mean? Not like a bit later on where they look Except like for Gene. Kinda, this era was not kind to Gene. He 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 always seemed to look like a big beefy linebacker trying to cosplay a share. And this yeah, time. I mean it was probably borrowing Cher's clothes, but that would be worth it. <laughs> well, they split up um, at this point, and by creatures he split up with Diana Ross. And you have a look at his face and you're like, how the <laughs> How the fuck? Yeah. Is it all confidence? Um, or, no, it's talk. Look at Vinny. Look at this weird looking dude. Right? 
very what a strange looking human and like the the wig does him eyebrows actually i just got i never looked at his eyebrows there that closely the eyebrows stand out as odd they're clearly drawn on i've said this before but my wife is not a kiss fan she's a kiss enthusiast if that makes sense like sure so but she says that she's a cosmetologist and everything. We're very accepting. But she says, I swear, if I ever meet Paul or Gina, I'll have to give them credit for having the first transgender in a rock band. There's no way Vinny. <laughs> and that's from, you know, I'm not saying that as a joke, but I'm just saying everyone I meet, whether or not, you know, when they realize I'm into Kiss, they always say the same thing about Vinny. Yeah. Like, what? Uh, <laughs> Especially I think, now. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I used to keep bragging on appearance, but when you're looking at a band like Kiss, image is very important as much as what you play. And I think that yeah. helped because he just... I mean, my five-year-old... My eight-year-old daughter was watching the Rio DVD I have, and she looked at Vinny and said, is that a girl? He looks weird. Yeah, I don't know. He's, he's also very clearly a tiny man. Yeah. Very clear, like a really diminutive, skinny little dude. And like Paul and Gina, obviously well over six foot. It's a very strange dude, man. I mean, but... I get away with it because he's a drummer. Yeah, that's right. Drummer's sitting down anyway. You're not looking at him. Yeah. But Look It Up is a pretty strong album. You know, I think the exciter reminds me of Creatures of the Night mixed with the Oath, but it's a great song. Totally agree. And I, and I suppose that links up with what we were saying before about how the Oath, under different production, maybe in different hands, could have been a much better song. And exciter proves that because that's a much, not for the innocent and a lot of Gene stuff on the eighth day, mm. reminds me of classic 70s kiss almost. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm going through the track listing here. Obviously, Look It Up is like... on it, really. No, there's nothing bad. There's nothing atrocious. No. Uh, I, I think... Creatures is stronger. I agree. I think that apart from Lick It Up, which is the probably the best song on the album, Gimme More is a bit not fantastic. For me, I just don't like, I don't love the pace of it. There's not enough going on, you know? Yeah. To justify the pace. I, I don't but know. It, Did you ever see that VH Hood movie about the parental advisory sticker and you get to see the priest up there sweating in church, reading the lyrics off of Give Me More in front of a bunch of houses? It's pretty funny. Come on and lick my candy cane. Give me more. Give me more. Oh, oh give me more. <laughs> and he's like dabbing his head of sweat. That's hilarious. Probably the most action he'd got all his life. Yeah. Um, but you got, yeah, you know, things in front of women. Also, this album does have Paul Stanley rapping, which yeah. is pretty funny because it exists. That no, it, before like the, the, the immortal was... line, hey man, I am cool, I am the breeze is from this album. So I've got to give it a pass for that reason. Um, just purely because like, I don't think there's a bad song on it. None of the songs are really phenomenal. None of them are really like, like, you know, if I went to see Kiss and they played like a million to one, I wouldn't lose my mind. I would lose my mind because I love that song, but I get what you mean. It's not, you know, when you think of Kiss in the 80s, you don't bring up a million to one. Yeah. I uh, also, there's no writing credit listed on this vinyl, unless I can find one in here. My but name. I'm pretty sure Eric Carr co-wrote All Hell's Breaking Loose, which is cool. You know, I almost I think that's saying, a, since you said that, for some reason, I'm thinking he may have wrote in, or that riff might be Eric's. That seems to, I think I remember. A good riff. That. I mean, but if you look at the writing credits here, Vinnie Vincent's got a co-write 
on every song but Fits Like a Glove and Dance All Over Your Face. Wow. Dance All Over Your Face is not a fantastic song from Gene. No. Um, I think that there Fits Like a Glove and Dance All Over Your Face are really emblematic of what Gene was doing in the 80s, which was just like rhyming words. Yeah. Well, rhyming, rhyming lines yeah, for no reason other than that he had to write a song. I have the best example of that on the next album, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. But, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty neat transition because we can go straight to Animalize. Um, this, is my, this is the last vinyl that I have, by the way. And this, the, is, I've got a cassette. <laughs> yeah, sick. Original, too. Oh. And, yeah. You know, I got to say that uh, in ending on the creatures and lick it up topic, it's a fine example compared to what Vinny did later of how much talent that motherfucker had. And just, I don't know how well, you almost have to try that hard to self sabotage yourself that bad. Yeah. But it is just a fuckwit. That's all yeah. I think it is. But uh, yeah. Animalize is fantastic. And I think it has a guitar solo by Bruce Kulik on one of the tracks. That's awesome if it does. I'm pretty sure oh. I mentioned that. I can't remember specifics, but you know. Um, yeah. Park also, Saint a John. pretty pretty iconic front cover. Yeah, I remember thinking it was cool as shit, and um, it's kind of cool how the cassette is sideways, so you get more of the album cover rather than mm. having, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I'd never seen that before. Yeah, I th I'm pretty. This is an original, you know. Um, you know. Yeah. Mark St. John, another great player that I think because of his association to Kiss, that there's so little, it helps create a mystery of its own. But, yeah. Well, I think that the story with him obviously is that he picked up. Um, this rheumatoid arthritis yeah. during the recording for this album that they thought was going to get better, that didn't get better, and they had to go on tour. So he lost the job, which is sad. But yeah. Paul and Gene have talked a lot of shit about his playing over the years, talked about him like being a proponent of like the Angry Bee style of playing, where it's just notes. And I've always thought that was kind of bullshit because... Like, they're in charge. They obviously told him to do that because that's what was popular. Yeah. It's like, there's no way that that guy had any creative freedom, you know? Yeah, and I mean, I've read in some circles that Mark was a drug user. I can't confirm because, you know, you can't go off of random people who say they knew him, you know. Have you read? I mean, I'm not convinced that the rest of them weren't. Chuck, chucking fucking power snakes on either but um just doing massive lines of cocaine but i'm sure paul smoked pot more than he's admitted there's a photo of him puffing with yeah Ethan i mean he definitely would have done it at art school but also i feel like either he just latently has the biggest ego of any human being alive or he was doing coke in the 80s who paul or gene paul i have a feeling paul's done more than he lets on like i, said. I mean paul's not a teetotaler but i don't think he like goes into it yeah like i don't think he has one of those addictive personalities yeah like yeah i don't you know, i don't buy have you read it. peter chris's book i have not that's one of the only ones of the original four I haven't read. I'm pretty sure in Peter Chris's book, he discusses after this album was recorded, he and Mark St. John went to do a thing together and he found like child pornography in Mark St. John's house. I don't know if this is real because Peter Chris is obviously a massive tripper, but... Peter Chris seems to have insinuated that Mark St. John was a pedophile. It's in his book. He just leaves it there. So it's just on one page and he doesn't talk about it for the rest of the book. He's not like, yeah, I cut him off forever. Wow. 
But he, he was clearly just this massive enigma who was a session guy who joined the band for a hot minute, got the exact same haircut as the guy who was in the band before him and then wasn't in the band. And I think that like his forgettability as a member of this band is kind of emblematic of a lot of the forgettability of this album. Yeah, I, think, I mean... I think, like, if you... like, I'm just going through this list here. I've had enough of the kick-ass song. I like a majority of this record, like I said, but... I think all of Jane's songs are rubbish. God-awful. Um, Murder in High Heels, Thrills in the Night, While the City Sleeps, all of which sound like... Raymond Chandler knockoffs. Do you know what I mean? They just sound like fucking. Yeah. Although I think Love the City Airport Sleeps is a really good song. I do like Get All You Can Take. I like Lonely as the Hunter. I like I've Had Enough. I like that better than I like Heavens on Fire, but that's a classic song. Burn, bitch, burn. Oh my God. I want to put my log in your fireplace. Yeah. On. We. <laughs> It's the, it's the most on the nose Gene lyric, but I, I have to give him credit for the sheer audacity of, I think for me, those are the three songs. Like I've had enough Heavens on Fire and Burn Bitch Burn are the three songs that I think of when I remember this album. The rest of them are utterly forgettable for me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I like Lonely as the Hunter. Um, Under the Gun is eh. Um, While the City Sleeps, I think is great. I do like Thrills in the Night. Um, oh, actually, Thrills in the Night is a decent song. Yeah, it's you're got a pretty good talking title. Thrills in the Night. Yeah. But no, um, I definitely agree with you. Murder in High Heels is absolutely throwaway. Murder in High Heels might actually be the worst song in the Kiss canon. I agree. I agree with you. It's literally the only one that I can say that I literally have no desire to hear after the first minute if i yeah. have desire to hear it at all and i i read that around this time was when they they stopped even recording together yeah and would Gino just like crap out demos that paul would have to work on and make usable yeah so jane's barely playing credit. any of the songs you know eric's obviously on the song you can hear eric's playing it's very busy it's very cool um but you know, Paul would be in one studio on one side of the country. Gene's in another studio on the other side of the country, maybe. Mark St. John is elsewhere getting instructions by phone. You know, it's this, it, I think that this is, I could be incorrect, but I'm pretty sure this is the beginning of the era of the band being really disjointed and doing albums so that they can have a single video hit. Yeah. And go Great. on tour in support of said hit. And Just continue to keep to themselves models. afloat. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's a and, rather fair assessment. Um, and like, look, I've got, I've got no issue with that. Uh, I've got no problem with it per se. I think the quality of albums dipped, but there's a lot of fun songs. The live shows all seem really well, I think the really difference cool. was is they weren't kings of the world anymore. And they weren't trying to be kings of the world. They were just trying to be a competitor at the end of the day. Yeah, trying that's to be right. A, they were trying to be a name, you know, they, they knew that the music climate had shifted. And even though they inspired what was happening, they realized they weren't top dogs. So they weren't trying to be top dog, which is probably a smart move for the time. Yeah. It's really interesting to think about because you have this entire, there's a whole generation that got into kiss when they weren't wearing makeup. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they were clearly, Especially you know, they went, in the UK and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And they toured there really extensively in the period as well. And this this time of like the the real peak of 80s like hard rock, heavy metal world, you know, where and Kiss would take band like Iron Maiden out or you yeah. know, Bon Jovi or Motley Crue. They were taking out a lot of the bands that became the huge bands of the era, but eventually would be, you know, I think that in the 80s, as a contemporary artist, they were probably eclipsed by a lot of the bands that they had either inspired or taken under their wing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which leads us to... Asylum. Asylum. 
which you know i think it's the last record that had eric carr's real drums i think they had him use a electronic kit from there on um i'm not certain on that i'm not certain on that but that's basically what the general consensus is yeah asylum is a great record um, I think it's definitely a production of its time. The outfits were ridiculous. But I think there's some good songs on there. You know, Secretly Cruel's good. Um, some of the deeper cuts. But yeah. once again, kind of like the album before it, not anything really to write home about. Yeah. So it's we're not even going to talk about the album too. That's correct. That's right. So we're not even going to talk about the Gene songs because they're all garbage. But there's a few pretty slick little Paul Stanley Desmond Child collaborations. You know, there's uh, All Night, which is classic Paul, pretty much exactly what you want from Paul Stanley. It's got a sick guitar solo from Bruce Kulick as well. Yeah. Um, obviously, Who Wants to Be Lonely is peak power ballad Paul Stanley. No trouble with that at all. And Tears Are Falling, which is a great single. I think Tears Are Falling is probably one of the strongest songs that Paul wrote in this period. And it's a solo. It's, one, it's a rare Paul Stanley by himself writing song. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, with a more cohesive lineup, like a band that was actually a band, not Paul Stanley plus three dudes and whoever else is writing that day, I think it would be a much stronger record. I think that if it was missing that god awful hollow eighties production, yeah. where like the guitars sound, the guitars just don't sound like guitars. The drums yeah. sound really weak. And yeah, I think if it was like Revenge, I think it would have fared better. I I totally agree. And like obviously it fared all right because it went gold. Yeah, it did well enough. But I'm. I think that, like, for the first album that's going to be, like, a stable lineup, it's so clearly, like, underwhelming. Yeah. You know, it's very much of its time. I think that it's probably stronger than Animalize material-wise, but maybe not by much. Yeah. Uh, I think King of the Mountain is probably one of the weirdest Kiss songs that there are just musically it's a bit weird lyrically it's a bit weird it, it seems a bit like paul stanley doing dio and bruce kulik and desmond child were like all right yeah. if you want i got you you know that's a good um, comparison yeah i saw because because you know paul stanley is prone to bursts of wanting to be someone else yeah. Right. You know, he was like, oh, I want to do a Rod Stewart song. So he wrote Hard Luck Woman. He yeah. wanted to try doing disco, wanted to do Chic, I guess. So he did I Was Made for Loving You. Exactly. Um, so clearly, he enjoys the challenge as a songwriter of being on somebody else's shoes and seeing if he can do it. Thing. Or the right, you know. Yeah. Maybe I've always thought musically it reminded me of Dio lyrically. It was a bit of a Dio thing. Yeah. Could also easily be like Maiden, you know? Yeah, you're not wrong. I can definitely get what you're that I can see that comparison. Yeah, it's a good. I, I think where I put this is like good, not great, you know? Yeah. Um, it, I don't think it's as bad as I'm sure a lot of people say it is i also don't think that it's phenomenal but i also don't think anyone's sitting around claiming it's phenomenal i think that uh, i think that's pretty, pretty well documented too that nobody thinks it's yeah. phenomenal but you know yeah but also a cool thing with the cover of it when you upload this video you should put like a still of the album cover is that the lipstick on each yeah. member from the, is like colored for their solo album covers, colors. And the ordering of them mimics the dynasty. Yeah. Or dynasty, as you guys say. Yeah, I'll do or, that for the thumbnail. I'll grab a thing of the 
album cover because I I can't edit a thumbnail, but I'll do that for the thumbnail for this. That's a good idea. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, it's a cool. Um, it's very much of its time, I think. I'm just having a look at see if there's any other cool information Absolutely. about the album. It just reeks of neon lights and cocaine and <laughs> yeah, and like platinum blonde hair and fake boobs and yeah, you know. Um, yeah, but clearly, do they, clearly doing right. it says here, as you mentioned before, they were doing well in England at the time. Yeah, uh, I know that a lot of a lot of people I know in the UK are really big fans of this era. Um, yeah. I also think that Bruce Kulick is fantastic on all the songs that I've heard from this album, all yeah. songs that I listen to. Bruce has never done anything bad. I'll give him that. Yeah, and I I would actually put Bruce Kulick as my favorite non. Ace Freely guitar player from Kiss. He's probably mine too, yeah. I, yeah, I think that he's it's arguable that he's probably the best guitar player they ever had, but he's my second favorite he guitar player. He had the ability to shred, but he also had the same influences that the band had itself at its inception. So, yeah, you know, he could put his own spin on the Ace stuff without deviating too much from it. My first Kiss record was a Live 3. So, yeah. Dude, and he rules that album. He oh, dude. Absolutely shreds. I don't care if it's fake as fuck. It's a great record. Yeah, who gives a shit? Yeah, um, exactly. But you know what? You know what's not a great record is Crazy Nights. <laughs> I was going to say, what's your thoughts on it? Because that actually did really well in Europe. Yeah, it did. Um, it clearly a o r <laughs> yeah i mean honestly the jeet song come hell or high water kicks ass and that's the yeah. only moment on this record that i could say it kicks and ass. you know that's a, that's a bruce and good girl gone bad's a good song too that's the weird thing about this album where the jeet songs are kind of highlights some of them yeah some. i think my my theory with this album is that I think that Bruce Kulick and Eric Carr had a bit of more of a pronounced role, so their songwriting contributions are a little stronger. But Paul Stanley wasn't about to let anyone tell him what to do, right? That's my theory. No one he was going to he was like the drummer's not writing a Paul Stanley song, okay? Paul Stanley writes Paul Stanley songs. But maybe Gene was a little more receptive. Maybe Gene was like, yeah, sick. Don't worry about it. I'll write the lyrics and I'll sing it. Because only Gene and Paul sang in this era. And I'm just I'm just having a look at um having a look at the track listing here. There's Good Girl Gone Bad. Oh Jesus Christ. Listen, Gene and Simmons can be such a deplorable. Just a vile human being. I love him, but he he said this. Um, the song "Good Girl Gone Bad" was based on, uh, as the name suggests, a good girl went bad. Gene knew where when he was going to college. Said a young lady that he went to college with, a girl who started out as a demure virgin, all coy and unclaimed, then met up with, in inverted commas, the tongue which I assume is Jean. Yeah. And then says the only sad thing about the tale is that when she finally did give way, it was in the backseat of a car and with a friend of Jean's. And I'm a bit like, who's that sad for? Because have you, if his sex tape is anything to go by, Jean's like leaves his T-shirt on. I don't think she missed out on much. <laughs> wow. One of 3,000 women or whatever it is, he says. Um, yeah. yeah, but Crazy Nights is one of these weird albums where some of the material is pretty strong and it did really well. But I think that, like Lick It Up, which was bigger commercially than Creatures, I think that it, it's like its chart positioning and its commercial success. Yeah. Um, its commercial success kind of flatters it by comparison to the material. Yeah. You know, I feel like it was a big hit, but 
yeah, I don't know. There's also some interesting stuff here from the Wikipedia page about the story behind the album. Um, and I, I've been to a few Bruce Killer guitar clinics oh, in my really? time. God. Yeah. And um, apparently the, like this was kind of like a, the period of commercial turnaround for Kiss, but the band was still, unfortunately the band was still like not functioning as a band. Yeah. And it was around this time that Eric Carr started having issues with the band. So he supposedly had stopped talking to the rest of the band during the tour for this album. Um, Paul Stanley even says that he was drinking more, might have been using drugs. And, you know, as we'd mentioned before, he was beginning to become a bit of a miserable bastard about how he's not like the original drummer or whatever. But he was also and, getting sick at this time and nobody knew it. Yeah. That's also true. That's also you, true. You have to think. Didn't he have a brain hemorrhage? I know he had cancer of the heart, but it spread to his brain. You got oh, it. I thought it, I thought it, I thought it was lungs and it spread to his heart. I I thought it was it might have been lungs that spread to the heart, but I thought it was heart that led to the brain eventually. Yeah. But I know Maybe that cancer obviously changes your whole body structure and talks with you. So, I mean, for him to be starting to act weird and us knowing it's years later, he'd be dead. We can kind of realize the hindsight. He was probably acting strange because he was acting strange, but he didn't know why. And he didn't know. You know, when you start to get sick like that, your body's going to react and your thought process is going to shift. So you true. know what's going on. You know, that's just what, in hindsight, what we got. Yeah. Like, hair falling out to me was a red flag. Like, I would have been mm. like, dude, the dude died of cancer. Yeah. You're like ragging on him for saying his thick hair is starting to fall out. Like, what you see what i mean yeah but um um that is a good point but i think that paul stanley was cracking the whip quite a bit for this record because it looks like they got the producer in uh ron nevison yeah upon his request because he'd been doing big hits for heart for aussie and that paul was sick of producing albums which is fine um apparently also cracked the whip on gene said it's not fair that you're screwing around everywhere else being in movies whatever i'm running this band yeah that's when and, he having talks with gene that took a few years to straighten out yeah but you know i'm just having a look at the track listing here quite a few of the songs are pretty pretty fun you know crazy nights i can't stand no 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 though yeah Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm I trying to. Is it bad for is that, is that, is it, is that the one that starts with the Kulik guitar solo? Where he's doing the same thing that's on eruption, basically, with the fast drum beat? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. It's like it's like an eruption guitar hot for teacher drums. Yep. Supposedly Bruce Kulik's favorite song really? on the album. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'll find hell to hold you. I think because I've seen footage of them playing Philly in '87. Yeah, and didn't Eric sing it live? Oh, maybe he did. Because I know there that'd was be, that'd be cool because he he co-wrote the song. I think I, I think they had Eric sing it live, or he sang it with Gene, one of the two. Um. But yeah, another weird album in this weird era. I kind of do like how they had like the fluorescent yellow lettering with the pink around it. Mm. But that's very representative of that time too. Yeah. You know, it's more pronounced on the cassette that my dad had, the original where the logo and the album cover were kind of separated back then. Yeah. But, uh, little nuances like that. But oh man what a weird album 
And Paul's yeah. ever last outfit for this tour was mm. even worse. Shocking. Those big in fairness, Paul's in Paul's in great shape. Up. Uh like in fairness, he's in great shape on the, around this time. So I'm sure if I looked like that, I'd wear fewer clothes than I currently do. But yeah, it's you know a very I mean? it's a very I'm weird vibe. Stage. I mean, I got it. Oh, I mean, the co the costuming, all of it. I mean, there's there's an anecdote about Gene from the era where he like he he went to like a store at an airport and got, brought this like glittering red top that like barely fit around his enormous shoulders, and like was wearing it on stage like it was a cool thing until he saw like this Italian grandmother getting about New York City. Wearing the exact same thing, and he was like, "I need to get my shit together." <laughs> um, I yeah, the last thing I want to talk about for this record is uh, "Reason to Live," which I think is something I said before. Right? It's not the strongest Paul Stanley power ballad of the '80s, but it's of the era, it was a huge one. I actually have the picture disc of it, not here, but I got it elsewhere. Nice. It's, yeah, as like a maxi single. Um, no, it's, it's a good song, you know. At least it's not your typical boy loves girl power ballad. Yeah, perfectly, perfectly serviceable power ballad. Um, I think it's it's such a weird record. It's so much so keyboardy, and I think yeah. that unlike some of the other ones that I've complained about the production on, I don't think the material would be stronger with different production. I think that a lot of the songs would be pretty much pretty much like the same like corporate rock. Yeah. Well, you know it, I mean? like I said, it was their AOR record. The thing yeah. about this era is you've get you've got Kiss doing a lot of different things. You know, really when you look at it like we are yeah um also i've just remembered that my way is on this album which you know for anyone listening is not sinatra's my way obviously no i know um but it's just it's just paul stanley going nuts with his vocal range just trying to sing as high as he can like by the end of by the end of the song he's like he's way up in like dogs come running register yeah not a fantastic choice from the star child but you know paul stanley can do what the fuck he wants he's paul stanley it's the same thing with gene simmons it's uh, gene simmons is like your nutty uncle that you just love <laughs> you know yeah that, yeah that's it it's like uh it's not worth starting the argument over the dumb shit he says at the dinner table yeah um i mean we can gloss over smash just real quick because of the two singles on that but it's kind of clear from the video, Paul doesn't even have a guitar. He's the front man. Yeah, and that's actually worth mentioning. Um, it's worth mentioning, you know, the band is trying to adopt like a slightly harder edged image here. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's in 1988, so it's after Appetite for Destruction has come out and like the full glam is starting to go away. Yeah, from music like the the really extreme like poison style androgynous thing is starting to become less popular, and the denim and leather is coming back. Uh, you know, the front cover of this album, you've got Paul Stanley, jacked, like front Paul Stanley's in superhero, like he's in superhero shape a full thirty years before there were any Avengers movies. <laughs> um. And there's some cool stuff with this album. You know, there's Eric Carr singing Beth. Yeah. Um, so that's that's cool. Yeah, Let's put the... I ever bought it. Yeah. Um, and obviously, Let's Put the X in Sex and You Make Me Rock Hard are not phenomenal productions, but I think that in terms of, like, the crass, you know, sexual metaphors... They're, they're like classic kiss, at least lyrically. I have um, to say, if I'm going to pick one of the two, I'm going to pick You Make Me Rock Hard. I think that song was better <laughs> done, I guess. Yeah. And 
look, it's so clearly just written to be like MTV videos, you know, yeah, like, let's put the X in sex has all these lyrics about like writing sexy letters and lace panties and whatever. And it's, 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 it's like it's what they were aiming for. Yeah. And I don't actually think that's a bad thing. No, but as you point out at this time, Paul Stanley is in full hair metal front man mode, not playing his well, guitar. That was partly because of Gene and, you know, fucking off. Yeah, that, that but I think it's interesting that he's not playing guitar in the video for the songs, despite the fact that he was probably one of the biggest artists on the BC Rich roster. Yeah. Right, this is the BC Rich era, I'm pretty sure, for Paul. I don't think he was back. Oh, yeah. I don't think he, don't think he was back with Ibanez yet. And uh, I think it's it's like, you know, you're doing an MTV video, you've got a guitar deal. They put in that you have to have the guitar in. So I wonder if there was something going on with his endorsement. That's a good question and something I never thought of before. Um, you know, and as far as the rest of Smash and Crashes, you get alternative cuts or alternative takes. There's a version of Love Gun where it's the full guitar solo. Oh, without that's cool. Yeah, there's different stuff like that. Different mixes from, you know, the earlier albums. Like different. Yeah. It, is it? it it's a, it's I a, love it. Yeah. Yeah, I love it loud without the fade out, I think. Yeah. Yeah, stuff like that. But really? You know, you look at the track listing and it's probably not dissimilar, not only to the Kiss set list at the time, but considering the remixed variations of some of the classics, it's probably pretty similar to how the songs would have been performed live at the time. Yeah, especially with the full guitar solo without the lo the Love Gun vocals over it. Yeah, that is an interesting idea. The 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 remixed classics. Yeah, they're like, well, we're gonna put out another, you know, compilation. Yeah, it's at least make it different, so it's at least worth their money to you know, rather than spend an album price on a single. Yeah, you know, yeah, totally. Um, you know, so that's where I got to give them credit, and you can say what you want, but they've always given us our money's worth. They've always given us, you know. Did they tour this album? I don't know if it was this album, but I know they did a really good tour of uh, Europe in 88. Uh, Night Bob, the sound guy, did their sound for that. Um, there's a video of them doing, I hate this era because Paul had that stockless guitar. Mm, the Steinberger. Yeah. I'm sure it was. Yeah. Um, so, but they sounded really good on this tour the mix the sound mix the band itself there's a video of tears are falling from 88 and it's pro shot on youtube you can actually hear eric carr's backing vocals really well and everything it's phenomenal um but i think that it just back ended on the uh monsters of rock um crazy nights tour i don't think it was necessarily touring for this record in specifics gotcha you know gotcha. it tour in 1988 yeah but it wasn't tracks they weren't necessarily tour. touring that album exactly that makes sense um now hot in the shade but they definitely toured hot in the shade because they had the the famous sphinx set yeah and that's yeah i've got i showed you the pictures i've got the uh tour passes for uh, Hot in the Shade and Revenge. Yeah. And Eric Carr's last record. Yeah. And um, also his first lead vocal. Little Caesar, which is one of the better yeah. tracks on the album. This album's very hit or miss. They're songs I like. You know, yes, I like King of Hearts, even though it's a lot of this record. I think they were demos that they never really cleaned up. Honestly, I don't think that they were, you know, fully recorded per se, like the rest of the albums. Yeah. 
I mean, there is some absolute shit on this album. This Boomerang, terrible song. Cadillac Dreams. Yeah. Uh, but there's also some really cool stuff, I think. Raid. Yeah. Uh, I which really I believe like that Fayette one. Code. Rise to it. Silver Spoon. Hide Your Heart. Um, you know, You yeah. Love Me to Hate You. I actually like that one. I don't know um, why. Also has one of my favorite kiss isms, um, which is like whenever whenever this band decides to grow a social conscience, and in the liner notes there's a warning of it to fans to not get AIDS, and it says <laughs> AIDS is not a party. <laughs> the street giveth and the street taketh away. I wonder if that was some kind of weird socio political thing. What? I've always, if you listen to that song, I'm pretty sure the lyrics are just about like street hustlers in New York and Jane being like, I'm like a tough New York guy. Yeah. But, um, I, I think that was a cover that, with Tommy Thayer. That's correct. Uh, he did Street Giveth and Street Taketh Away and Betrayed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Those are two yeah. good songs. Man, That's Tommy good. Thayer knows his way around the chorus. I'll give him heaps of credit for that. I think his it's it's almost it's actually not that dissimilar to how i like to write chorus it's just like you know there's like really nice long vowel sounds they're really easy to sing along to mm -hmm. you know i'm very into it um i i i can tell you know i'm a fan of your stuff and yeah well seeing but, um, that you know we've got such a love for kiss as deep as we do it's no wonder <laughs> yeah of course um, um, and obviously the big single from this album is Forever. Yeah, which was a co-write with Michael Bolton, which he tries to say, oh, this is a song I wrote for Kiss, when he didn't really care about it until it was a hit, yeah. of course. Yeah, um, and, you know, also, let's all be honest, Forever is so clearly a Paul Stanley song. Yeah. The, the thing you I know, like about the, the Paul and Gene dichotomy is that, like I said, you're right. And I don't doubt your statements about Paul's lifestyle and stuff, because there's a lot of really, as much as he plays a lot of it off, he puts a lot of emotion behind his songs where Gene doesn't. Yeah. As much as Paul's a, a workhorse like Gene, Paul's got the passion and the heart and the life experience I don't think Gene has. Totally. And you Absolutely. can tell, like, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, Tonight You Belong to Me is one example. And his mm. whole record, there's some gut-wrenching emotional content there for a cheap band like Kiss. Yeah. And songs like You Love Me to Hate You, I think I connect with not just on a musical level, but a subject matter. You know, mm. I if it's relatable to me, I'll dig it usually you know what i mean um yeah but read my body is fucking terrible like i said i can't stand cadillac dreams i know i should like it because it's kind of punky but it, it's um, no, it sucks you know boomerang um, pretty is much, awful. pretty much all the jane songs are pretty weak yeah other than the ones that tommy helped write yeah um but you know, I think that Rise I do to like it, somewhere between heaven and hell. I don't That's know fair. why. There's certain songs I, like this that are odd that I just really like. I think somewhere between heaven and hell has a mood, a vibe. Yeah, I feel like the vibe I've kind of makes up for anything how that song sounds. in a way. You know, um, I think on Read My Body, you can hear my claim of electronic drums. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely some program drums on this record. Um, Rise to it also has that cool slide guitar at the beginning. Oh yeah, but it also has one of the weirdest video intros, which is like Jane and Paul in the makeup, ostensibly pretending it's 1975. Yeah, and it's just like for ages they just go back and forth, being like, "We should take the makeup off. You're crazy. Take the makeup off. You're crazy. Well, I think we could take the makeup off." And it, it's just yeah. like just stop the fucking song man which sucks because the rest of the video is fucking cool 
I yeah, hundred percent. <laughs> so funny. Um, but yeah, pretty decent record. I thought not for me. Pretty much everything between "Lick It Up" and this is of similar, like aggregate quality overall. Consider the album as a whole: combination of songwriting, production, uh, cohesion within the band, album art, whatever else, videos, maybe. Yeah. I think they're all about level on goal difference. You know, some of them have stronger songs than others. Some of them are, you know, they might have a cooler Paul Stanley moment or a cooler Gene moment than others. Obviously, this has got this cool little moment for Eric Carr with Little Caesar. Caesar. Man. And it's so sad that it was his last, his first and his last. Yeah, because he's got a good voice. He always did. Him doing Black Diamond, like, you know, mm. I, I, him and Eric Singer are so close in drum stylings that I really think that it comes down to the fact that Eric just was such a sweet guy. And I think it's also the fact that, and I love his drum style, but I think it's the fact that he had a, his own character and makeup. That might be why I kind of like him maybe a little bit more. He seems more iconic to me. Mm. Uh, take away anything eric singer did there's stylistic differences between the two yeah although it's worth pointing out that eric singer is on the next record which is in my opinion the best record of this era and i would probably honestly if you're looking for something that represents what kiss is all about 100 percent, revenge is a back to basics that's more um, yeah this was i it sucks because at, at this juncture, we didn't know it yet, but it was one of the last times they'd be without makeup. And they finally hit their stride, I think. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, by 92, grunge was breaking. I think, when's the Black Album? Is the Black Album about 90, 91? 91. Yeah. yeah. So, Metallica that along done with Use Your Illusion, which was another deviation in a way. Yeah. But, you know, I think that at this time, the glam metal thing is well and truly dead. And I think this is like a frightening return to form for, you know, that was like super poppy for about 10 years. And then they were like, all right, let's do what we do. Let's do this. You know, let's do like a really beefy, like ballsy rock and roll record. It's the heaviest thing they did since Creatures, honestly. It has a lot in common with Creatures. It's the same kind of idea. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that it's um, you know, the the overcorrection. Yeah. Whereas when where where you have with creatures, you have like this massive course correction after music from the elder. I think it's more subtle. I think that Hot in the Shade was as still like a glam album, but it, it, it's it more was a nice, hard rock. A, a than, nice buffer. They were yeah. already starting to return to basics. It was kind of like, you know near completion but not quite you know what i mean yeah and you know i think i think this record is just fucking it's a great record you know unholy opens with a gene song which is cool you have you don't always get that from a kiss album you get take it off you get spit which has gene and paul singing together and spit's a fucking amazing song dude i'm such a sucker for when those two guys trade lyrics yeah uh the captain's on god gave rock and roll to you as well yeah i think i actually think that every song on this record is a slam dunk oh yeah heart of chrome i mean i can this is just off the top of my head you know like yeah i'm curious how they avoided legal trouble (laughs) because he got a writing credit but how do you put the instrumental demo of breakout as a tribute to eric carr i think ace obviously had to give permission no they just replaced his part really because that was a recording from 81 yeah, no, they got they. It's a recording from '81, and they replaced Ace's part with a Bruce Kulick recording. 
Oh wow! And they were like, "See you later." That's awful. <laughs> that Eric and Ace wrote that song. Uh yeah. Eric Carr is credited as the sole writer of Car Jam '81. But all that is is the instrumental jam that was Breakout. Yeah, that's that. right. Jesus Christ! Pretty funny. Uh, shiesty, shiesty. That's the rock. I know. Rock, are you? Yeah. No, and actually, the floor I think this for is... this was great. The stage was great, but the audience still wasn't coming. I have uh, the DVD of their opening night in Bethlehem in '92. Maybe thirty-five hundred. Wow. Because I saw, um, I've got Kissology 3, which obviously has the Alive 3 recording or one of the Alive 3 recordings, and they've packed out the stadium mm -hmm. in Detroit. But I suppose... It, it might have been a bit more attended there, but I mean, <laughs> not by much. They weren't playing anywhere near like they were on the same level. Mm -hmm. I mean, 76 and, you... and, and Anaheim... They had 20,000. Mm. You see what and I you mean? know, you know, there's, there's, it's also a really good return to form for Bob Ezrin after the elder. Yes. Like the mix, the we production back on the map too. You know, um, I've, as I, as I said, I've been to a few Bruce Keeley guitar clinics. He talks about the way the guitars were recorded. Using, he used a really broad variety of guitars, pretty much pulled out all of his studio guy tricks for this album. Wow. You know, there's, you know, that the heaps of different guitars with different takes. He really it thought like about Bob Ezra was work. the 70s Mutt Lang. Yeah. Yeah, really thought about all of his guitar work, you know. Um, there's, I remember he said at a guitar clinic in Sydney, talking about his lead lines on Domino and really mapping out the voicings and the chords and everything else and you can tell you know, because that's just so perfect that's one of his best solos yeah absolutely there's also a really gnarly i'm trying to remember which song it's on you know uh tough love is probably the best example of it but this sounds on the whole album that really gnarly fuzz tone that he has yeah oh yeah where unlike a lot of the 90s fuzz tones which which are like a wall of sound it's still very articulate yeah and how he did that was he would track one clean take like one sound one guitar sound would be clean one sound would have the fuzz on it oh, nice. and submix them so i don't know if he recorded stereo or if he did two separate takes but okay. that's what he said and that and that's why it's got that really characteristically like Hendrixian sort of level of articulation. Oh, yeah. well, what I love is how he put uh, the Star Spangled Banner in the spit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, fucking A, how do you do that? It works. Yeah, it's such a good view. Like, it just, um, it fits right in there. I am shocked that they didn't get a lawsuit off Spinal Tap for that song. For the bigger the push and the better the bigger the cushion, the better the pushing. Yeah, that is true. But yeah, as far as I'm concerned, this album is an absolute slam dunk. Yeah, absolutely. American sporting term. And like I said, it's one of the last because we're going to do it in albums as they were recorded and supposed to be put out, I guess, in this, mm -hmm. once we get to this point. Um, but Carnival of Souls wasn't released till after the reunion happened. So those tapes were shelved. And I think they started working on that as early as 94. Yeah, that's right. And Carnival of Souls was also full release very much slapped together it's not fully sealed i did open it and play it once but i kept the bottom part of the packaging because it's got the hype Oof. sticker and i paid much more than 9.99 for this it was <laughs> um cool which i love um i like this record personally um it 
as we said, it it's definitely a different vibe. You know, it's the second red herring, I'd say, out of all of them. Yeah, I do not love this Carnival of Souls. I think it has the first, like Eric Carr, the last record and the last song on it is Bruce Kulik's first and only lead vocal. Yeah, also the first appearance of Bruce Kulik with a beard. Yep. But yeah, I ju- for me, I think that if, if it had been another band, I might like it more. Much like The Elder. I yeah. Think. Or, you know, if the songs had been worked on a little more, you know, some of them sound a little disjointed, like The Elder. Some of them sound a little incomplete. Yeah. Well, I mean, going down the song list and see, I'm one of those rare people where I'm sitting here with a Kiss Gold record, Kiss t-shirt, but I've also got the obsessed, my obsessed sign drum head. I am a fan of what's known as the bad G word, grunge. I'm a fan of punk too. And I know a lot of the guys in the G word scene. And I actually shared, I walk alone one time and someone was like, this Okay, obviously I said, this is Kiss, but it's completely different than what you think. Give it a shot. There's a couple people who bought this because they're like, even if it is just Kiss pandering to that, there might be something on it I can be influenced by. And these are people who would never buy a Kiss record in their life. Um, You know, I Walk Alone is probably the strongest track on the record. Um, I could tell you Rain uh, I like the song, but I could tell you right now, all I can think every time I hear it is this is them trying to write Rain When I Die by Alice in Chains. Yeah, and that um, seems that's one of the big problems I have with this record. Is like see, the, the Paul songs, songs are the ones that I have trouble with on this more so than the Gene, which is that's exactly right. Yeah, that's part and of it. It's, it's a curious opposite to the 80s where, like, the Paul songs are the good ones. The Gene, Gene seemed to have fun pretending he was in Metallica. Like, he seemed, <laughs> to, he seemed to be... It doesn't happy. sound like Metallica to me, but it might have been Metallica at that era. I don't like Metallica, so I hear more Alice in Chains-isms. Yeah. I, hear, um, I definitely hear that on Paul Stanley's songs. I will say Master and Slave is a damn good one by Paul. That's probably the most cohesive on this album by Paul. Probably the most Paul Stanley ish of all of them. But Bruce Gillick gets a lot of co writing credit on this album. Oh, yeah. Like I said, the Gene songs, like Hate is Okay, I Love Master and Slave, Childhood's End. I don't know why, but I've always liked that song. Um, Jungle was eh. In My Head's pretty good. I love Seduction of the Innocent. Um, and I love I Walk Alone. You know, that's pretty much this album for me. Um, that's not to say the other songs aren't bad, but I can listen to this album the whole way through. But like Gene, I think it's because the darker personality of Gene, where Paul was kind of like, I'm the star child. What the fuck do I do? Yeah. And I think that for I that can- reason, I think for that reason, it's an interesting inversion of type. You know, it's an interesting inversion of the what you typically have expected from Unmasked Kiss. Yeah. And it's an interesting capture. I think if the album had been finished, it might be stronger. If it was a little shorter, it might be stronger. I think that if Paul Stanley had, I don't know, you know what I reckon? If this had, I can't believe I'm saying this, if this album had no Paul Stanley on it, and it was just yeah. Gene doing mean Gene. I reckon it'd go a little better. Yeah. I but agree. Gene left I to agree. his own devices, likes to pretend that he's Bob Dylan. So yeah. I do like Childhood's End. I mean, I've related to that song since I was a teen. So I I feel that song on a personal level, but it's weird how the one record out of all this we're saying the Gene songs are the highlights. Yeah, I another mean, Tommy Thayer co-write, by the way, Childhood's End. 
Yeah. I that's right. But yeah, I mean, obviously I like it enough to pay 30 bucks for a sealed cassette that I opened and played once. Yeah. And the other the thing that we could book end this era with, which I usually stay away from live records, but this had to do with the reunion and sparked it. I love this album. I love this. Yeah, I actually think that I think that Unplugged is I think Kisses Unplugged is the best MTV Unplugged personally. I know that I'm sure there are a lot of like very, very serious music fans and like grunge guys who are going to be mad that I said that because Kurt Cobain did one. But I think that they didn't even want his released. (laughs) Yeah, that's because he was a fucking winger. But um (laughs) Yeah, I th- I, th- I think that you know, Kiss Unplugged is an awesome live record. I think that they all play really well. I Jean, love the deep cuts you get. Gene rules this album. Gene's bass playing is so spot on, and I think it's one of the best showcases of his bass playing, which is severely and, underrated. Yeah, if he's like he he's, plays he's like Paul really McCartney did. Yeah, you know. Um, you know, Paul Stanley obviously kills the vocal. He's really great all over this record. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I Still Love You, the live version of I Still Love You from this is oh, yeah. fantastic. I love that they started off with Coming Home from Hotter Than Yeah, I, I love I, that. I, that is such a good song. It really is. Not, on, not only is that like a great song, but it also... To, to me, it's it's a really nice inclusion, considering that this is what sparks the reunion the era. Yeah. So, like the final, is it the what was the final release of the pre-reunion era? It starts with a song called "Coming Home," and it's a bit like it's kind of funny that they're all sitting around playing acoustic too. Yeah, on top of it, you know. But, I mean, the track listing alone is awesome. You know, you got Coming Home, obviously, Plaster Caster, which is a hilarious oh, and classic Blind, Which has always been one of my favorite Gene songs. Um, also, See You Tonight is on this album, and that's one of Gene's best songs. Yes. That and Mr. Make Believe. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think Mr. Make Believe sucks, personally, but... On the end. Because originally it was a vinyl only version. Yeah. Because I had the CD as a kid and I wanted the vinyl because the extra track and I finally got it. Fulfilled yeah. childhood dream. <laughs> um, yeah. So I actually first heard this on Kissology 3. I didn't have the CD. I saw the performance, which has got okay. all the extra stuff on it, which is yeah. really cool. I had the VHS tape before they released the uh, Kissology stuff. I've got the full. Uh, it sucks. I don't know if I can get you a copy, but I've got the full with the mistakes and different takes. Yeah, that's awesome. Four hour. It's even more than what's on Cosology. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it, it's yeah. the whole taping, the whole raw taping from start to finish. It's like twi- it's double the length of the stuff on Cosology. Because they have yeah. to play songs like over and over, you know. It's cool to watch, though. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Um, also, I didn't know if you knew that there was more out there than what they put on Cosology. I had no idea. That's really cool. You also, can see Paul break a string and they have to stop the song and restart it. They actually did like five different takes of Domino. There were five different false starts. It wow. gives you a realistic experience watching. Just the Kissology stuff made it more real and showed them, mm. like, you know. But you get twice as much of that on this. I'll have to see if I can try to make you a copy and mail it to you or something. Because as yeah, a cool man. man, it would be more, it's the treasure trove in a way, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that would be really cool, man. Thank you. Um yeah, I think it's a really good album. I think it's a really strong performance. Everyone's great. Yeah, and I just love the 
all the different eras that they pulled yeah. from. I mean, bringing out something from the outer, you can hear the crowd erupt for that. Yeah. And on on that note, actually, the on the Kissology behind the scenes thing, they point out that rehearsing for this, they had every <clears throat> member of KISS ever who is still alive in the same room except Vinnie Vincent because Tommy Thayer obviously was working for them. Yeah. So you've got uh, Eric Singer, Peter Chris, Bruce Kulick, Paul Stanley, Gene, obviously Ace and Tommy Thayer. Um, Vinnie Vincent obviously is persona non grata forever. Yeah. But you know, I, I don't. I don't know if Mark St. John was still alive then. Yeah, he was. He but, didn't pass till the two thousands. I was in high school. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, Bruce could have shown how to play that album probably just as much. Mm, absolutely. So, but yeah, that is wild to think about. You know, and has Bruce touched on? Because I mean, him and Ace. I always thought there was a rift, but Ace has even come out and said that he likes him. Has Bruce said, like, was it enjoyable for him or was it? I Because you've seen the went, guitar clinics. Yeah. So I, I remember someone asked about that. And he said it didn't occur to him at the time that this might be him out of a job. He thought, you know, based on Ace and Peter's playing on this record, it was like, this is fun. This is a nice celebration, but we're going to go back to the studio, go on tour Finish and keep fun. doing this. Yeah. yeah. He, said, he said that he had no idea that the reunion thing was coming until one day Gene and Paul were like, we're going to do that. And then, but then he got the grand funk gig pretty much yeah. straight away, I think. Yeah. And I mean, you, he was in Kiss for so long. And he's been, been in Grand Funk for even longer. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Like having that kind of recognition and doing all that stuff and all the different stylings that Kiss decided to go through and do as well. Yeah. I just realized, sorry, it wasn't Grand Funk that he joined straight away. It was, it was Union, Union with John Karabi. And I love that stuff. I actually, um, I have a signed CD of the Blue Room that I bought from Bruce. And I've got a signed photo of Bruce from the Asylum Tour that I bought from his website. You know, Man. I love Bruce. I think he's very underrated in the scheme of things. But um, yeah, I think that he's a I terrific love guitar Union. I love Union. I don't, John Karabi's not really doing much of anything. I know Bruce has his own thing, but I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'd love to see Union get back together and do some stuff. So I feel like yeah. with the passage of time now, they'd go down a storm. Yeah, I think so. We're and a good band. Both records are solid, too. I don't know if you've yeah. ever listened to them. No, I have. What was that mad song of one of them? I really liked Old Man Wise. Yeah, it's off the first one. Yeah, um, that's a really good song. Just to refresh your memory, uh, the song Dead on Blue Room is fucking fantastic. Yeah. But, yeah, cool. Yeah, and so, I mean, and we all know what happened with the reunion and everything thus far, but, I mean, why do you think, is it the, the non-makeup thing, or what is it about this era that why the group kind of ignores it or doesn't really give it its just due? You know, that's a good question. I've always thought that it was just a matter of how successful the reunion tour was. And, you know, if they were, if they want, wanted to go and do this material, they'd probably be doing theatres. They'd probably be relegated to where the venue that Ace is playing. But if they continue playing the classic era material... With the classic makeup and stage show. The, with the makeup and the show, they can still play arenas. Yeah. 
And you know, I can't I can't fault him for it. Because I've no. seen I've seen him a bunch of times uh, with the singer like, player lineup. I've seen him three times, and the first one was the original lineup on the farewell tour. But the other two times I've seen him have been with Eric and Tommy. You know? Yeah, and they're still great. They're still terrific. Oh, you know, yeah. Every time that I saw them. And in recent years, they have started doing more obscure songs, particularly from this era. You know, they brought back War Machine, Crazy Nights. Yeah, when I saw them in 2004, they really surprised us with the set list. And I still have the instant live. I got War Machine and Got to Choose and you know, they really pulled the gamut. And even when I saw them in 2019, I mean, I I saw them at one of the shows that wasn't recorded by anybody, which kind of sucks, but it's kind of cool. But I got to see the banded makeup play Crazy Nights. That's pretty damn cool. I mean, I like the set list that they've been doing with the classics that you have to play. Um but I really like that they're throwing War Machine in and that's become more of a staple, which is classic Kiss. I mean, you know, um, Crazy Nights and uh, so many others. I mean, I've gotten to see, I've only seen Kiss thrice, but the set list that I've gotten each time, you know, I can't bitch at all, you know? Yeah. People might yeah, have been kissed in the rain, but have you ever seen Kiss in the Rain? I <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, they're really great. And I think, you know, this is a cool era. And it's cool to see Bruce Kulick occasionally embracing it as part of his legacy. And when I've seen, I've saw him play uh, the bar in Sydney, Frankie's Pizza which is like the rock bar in Sydney, yeah. if not in Australia. And like, it's not abnormal to see like Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick do karaoke there. That's awesome. Um, so I saw him play with the house band there and he just did this era. He just did like this sort of stuff. And I also recently went to a, a tribute night, a Kiss tribute band night where Kiss Deria, who are Australia's number one and supposedly the world's number two Kiss tribute band, and another group called Sisters Doll, who you might be familiar with. Yeah. Um, but if you're not, you should check them out. Um, and they, so Kiss Deria did classic Kiss and Sisters Doll did 80s Kiss. And it was really cool uh, to see how receptive people were to it. So I think that there's a lot of love from like the hardcore fans, but I think that like your average punter, they, you know, they want to hear like the songs they hear on rock radio. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how that works. But like I said, you know, I really think that this era, I think we covered it well. I think there were some details that you brought up that I didn't know. There were details that I brought up that you didn't know. You know, so I feel like this was good to do because there's so much more to learn. There's, you know, you can't, the, the 70s kiss has been so documented. There's really not much more you could say. I mean, we could do a follow up and do it just to complete it. But, you know, the 80s and the unmasked era from 1980 to 96 is really unique there's a lot of different stylings that they went through. There's a lot of different phases. There's a lot of history there that doesn't always see the light of day, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Like, I mean, you may, you know, I would go nuts if they decided to come out and opened up with Exciter. I know Paul can't sing it anymore, but damn. You know, like there's just so much powerful stuff. And I like the fact that there's so much like they kind of went off the track a little bit in a way. It gives you something different. You know, they didn't just I don't know. They had the balls to try something different. And even if it didn't work, they still stood by it. Respect, you know. 
Yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, as we've just talked, there's nothing wrong with trying something new. There's nothing wrong with flexing your muscles in yeah. various different ways. Um, particularly if you've got like those really well-defined 80s muscles that Paul Stanley had. You know? He did. It was a good time. Yeah. But, um, ugh. so if you had to pick a favorite record from this era, what would you pick? Revenge, easily. Creatures. Least favorite? <laughs> I would probably say Animal Eyes. Hmm. Probably say Animal Eyes or Music I'd from the Elder. The same. Either that or Hot in the Shade, one of the two. Or Crazy Night to me. Not Hot in the Shade. It's weird because in the late 80s, they almost got to sort of blend. <laughs> yeah, that is. That's it. The Kulik era, unfortunately, as much as I love him feels like yeah. it's just one time but i mean it's hard to think that his tenure was like over 10 years mm, yeah. yeah 96 7 you know yeah that's right but all right i think that's pretty much all we could really say i mean they did the reunion tour it went nuts and they're still out there today <laughs> yeah yeah that's it i can't can't, can't fault him for it no, I mean, it just would be nice. I don't know. I almost kind of hope in a way. Um, I got two more things to say, and this is one of them. I kind of hope in a way after they, because they can't do a show of their magnitude. Who's to say that they won't do a stripped down, you know, non-makeup club shows here and there or something, you know? Mm. Um, and the other thing is, because there's an anniversary of the elder, the only thing I'll give people is if you're confused by the elder, if you hear what Paul and Gene did prior to forming Kiss with the Wicked Luster stuff, it's a little bit more forgiving. Wouldn't you agree? I mean... Yeah, definitely. I think that the, um, the different musical inclinations of that time yeah. become much more obvious. Yeah, it, it's, it's almost weird how it seems like The Elder is such a, what? That's not anything like Kiss. But actually, if you go back to their yeah. roots, it has more in common with Wicked Lester, actually. Mm. And I don't know if a lot of people have ever thought of it that way. But, you know, I only ever got a hold of the full recordings on disc like a few years ago. And I was like, God damn. It's not as bad as they say it is, but <laughs> it's, it certainly lacks like the cohesion and the vision. Oh, yeah. They admit that it was a hodgepodge, you know, and that's available on YouTube as well. If anybody's curious, I've actually played when the bell rings a few times on my radio show before. You know, just pulling out a deep cut, like, hey, this is the origins of Kiss. And it's one yeah. you can hear them both sing together. Gene's voice on that is really strange to me. It's nice to hear Gene do something other than, <laughs> you know, but absolutely. I enjoyed this. Thanks for joining me on this. Um, no worries, man. And yeah, if you want to do some offshoots sometime, like do the solo material, it'll make me have to dig into Peter Chris's solo stuff. But you don't need to do that. <laughs> well maybe we could do an ace episode or something you know but um yeah if you like what we're doing here guys hit the like button hit the subscribe um i really enjoyed this panel with you liam this was fun um my son's name is liam so it fucks with me actually saying your name aloud sometimes so um it's fine. as long as you don't speak to me like you speak to him it will be okay oh no we're fine he's a seven year old hyperactive kid so no <laughs> clearly a difference yeah but, um, i'm just being sleepy hey <laughs> nothing wrong with that yeah that's right but thank you so much man i really enjoyed this you know and i learned stuff from you and i guess you learned some things from me always and hey leave a comment 
leave us your favorites from this era, you know, and check out Flicker Tales latest EP coming out, guys. And Golden Robot Records, the link will be in the description. Thanks again. This has been fun. Anytime I can nerd out about rock music, I take that opportunity. <laughs> Not many. Yeah, times. what a great time, man. All right. Well, this has been another episode of Rock and Roll Gypsy Diaries. Till next time, that's Liam from Flickertail, and I'm Andy Thunders. Peace. <laughs>